in one minute or so, we're going to start live streaming this on, on my Facebook page. Uh, so I need you guys to all cheer really loudly so that we make it seem like it's a really big deal for everyone tuning in online. I mean, it is a big deal, but, you know, just so we get the excitement going. Are we almost ready to live stream? Okay, ready? Three, two, one. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for coming to watch this session, um, the YouTube Masterclass. Um, as I mentioned, we're live streaming this on Facebook as well. So um, hello to everyone on the internet. Um, uh, thank you so much to the GSF organizers and to the Varkey Foundation for inviting me and bringing me out here to talk. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to talk today to you about education and about YouTube. Um, I feel really welcomed here in in Dubai by the warm, warm weather. It's like a warm, sweaty hug at all times. It's great. Um, and uh, for those of you watching at home, because I know you all know what we're here for, but this is, um, I'm Diana Cowern. I'm the host of the YouTube channel Physics Girl, which is part of the PBS Digital Studios Network in the US. Um, and we're here at the Global um, Education and Skills Forum in Dubai for discussions about education. And this, this will go on all weekend and culminate in awarding a teacher a million dollars for excellence in education. So that's very exciting. I am very much looking forward to celebrating the real, the real heroes of education, which are the classroom teachers. So that will be a lot of fun for all of us. Um, how many of you are teachers, just out of curiosity? Okay, a lot of you. Awesome. Woo! And for those of you at home who raised your hand. Physics teacher. Yes. How many of you are physics teachers? Oh, yeah, there's a cohort over here. Um, for those of you at home who raised your hands, thank you so much as well. I can't, we can't see you, but thank you for raising your hands. Um, how many of you are students? Okay, awesome. A handful of students in here. That's fantastic. Great. Um, yeah, so we're all here to talk about education, which is a big portion of what I do. Um, I, uh, as I'm sure you know, um, I run a YouTube channel about physics. I'm sure you know this because you've watched dozens and dozens of my videos. Um, but in case you haven't and you need a refresher, here's a little preview of what I do on my YouTube channel. I'm just gonna drag this plate through the water in the pool. Look what forms. There's so much physics happening here. <laughs> Subscribe to Physics Girl and let's explore the world with physics. So that's the, um, the big message is to subscribe to the channel. <laughs> no, the big message is um, that I am obviously very passionate about science, about physics. Um, and uh, we're going to talk more about passion and how that plays a role in education. But first, I want to talk about your passions. So I want to do a little exercise with you. We're going to take two minutes, and I want you to talk to the people sitting next to you um, or think to yourself about what drives your passions. If you're at home, maybe talk to your cat or your dog or whatever. Um, Ta think about what drives your passion. So, so whatever it is your passion is, maybe it's making videos on the internet, what is it that drives that passion and makes you take your passion and turn it into action? So what is it? What driver makes you, you know, decide to finally make the video that you've been thinking about doing for years? And then maybe make 100 videos, or teach for 10 years, or, you know, train for a race a swimming race for six months. What is it that drives that passion? And then as an added bonus, you can tweet about this, hashtag what drives my passion, answering the question, what is it that drives you to take your passion and do some action with it? Um, so again, take two minutes to do that and talk with the people next to you. So uh, we talked a little bit about 
about YouTubing, the passion for YouTube and aviation over here. Um, hopefully I will see all of your responses later with this hashtag. Um, but I tweeted this question out actually to my followers yesterday. And uh, these are some of the responses that I got back. So um, from at Athens spot, I never know how to pronounce Twitter handles. They're impossible. Um, but he talked about that feeling of accomplishment, um, especially when you're helping others, which is worthwhile. Um, a desire to see the finish from at Irville, to, to actually finish a project. Uh, someone talked about just flat out curiosity or falling down the rabbit hole of curiosity. Um, we've got uh, from at Ariel Waldman, she just gets really annoyed if something doesn't exist in the world, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> like, so she finds out something doesn't exist and she must make it. Uh, and then from at Jonah111111, uh, the desire to win, so that's good. that's drives a lot of passions, I'd say. Um, so yeah, some of the, the themes here are pretty common. There's innate curiosity, which drives a lot of people's passions. There's um, improving the world around us. Uh, and there's improving ourselves, or sort of leveling up, like taking ourselves and moving on to the next level. Um, and then, of course, there's having fun and winning. Uh, so these themes um, come up over and over in successful careers. And what I, sh what I wanna share with you today is my story of becoming a YouTuber and some of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way, um, and then how these themes have showed up in my work. I think it's so funny to call myself a YouTuber when they were like, come talk about being a YouTuber because what I do is so different from people who uh, you know, vlog their cats that get stuck in Pringle cans and things like that. Um, but is it that different? I mean, it all starts with a passion for something, could be a passion for your cat. Uh, for me, that thing that I was passionate about was science communication. So YouTube was not always my life goal. Uh, I went and studied physics at MIT, like a good little nerd. And then uh, I did some astrophysics research after that at Harvard. And then I worked making iPad apps at General Electric. Um, but during all of this STEM career, I had a secret deep inside, which was that I had made a video in high school in the, in the last year before college about s sort of, it was a science communication project for my senior project. Um, but the video, the goal of it was to combine the popular shows my friends were watching, like The Bachelor, with science. So uh, it's kind of hard to imagine, you know, like, Becky, will you take this rose and now let's smash it with liquid nitrogen, which would have been awesome <laughs> if that's what I had done. But I made something that was called Beauty Picks the Nerd, which was more like a nerd dating show, and it was horrible. It was, oh no. No, it was so cringy. Uh, it was bad. Uh, let's just say it never gained the, same, gained the same following as Game of Thrones, but it is in my past. So the point is, that was over 10 years ago. So for 10 years, I've had this passion for science communication. Um, so I started Physics Girl as a hobby after I graduated from college. And, uh, and I wanted to do science, you know, that was sort of my side project, my, my um, passion project, as you will. Uh, but I felt pulled at that point between my passion for science communication and this traditional job working in an office uh, on iPad apps, which was great, I loved it, but I just, I felt like my real passion was for science communication. Um, and now, it's not every parent's dream that their daughter leaves her shiny new engineering job to go and become a YouTuber, but that's exactly what I did. Uh, oh, here, this is, a, this is a picture at MIT. Uh, so one day, finally, I decided to make the leap and I left my, all of my jobs that I had had, um, my ping pong career, working in all different things, and I worked, started working full time on YouTube. And since then, I have made over a hundred videos. This is just a sampling of some of them. I've gone on the zero G plane, which is the plane that goes in parabolas and you feel weightless. This is our experience doing that in Bordeaux in France. I've 
played with liquid oxygen back at MIT, where I went to school. I asked physics riddles to the CEO of YouTube. So it has been an amazing wild ride since I decided to sort of leave the traditional job and go on and work full time on YouTube. Um, but more profoundly than all of the experience, are all the experiences that I've been able to have have been the messages that I've received from parents and kids and future scientists that say that you know somehow they've connected with my silly videos. So one father wrote me about his daughter who was playing physics girl the way that I used to play Barbies. And uh, so she's pretending to be me. And I took her video and I edited it in my typical style. And so I'm, I'm honored to be able to show you that video today of Santasha. So I found you and you're watching physics well. If you toss this up, it will just hit on your knee. If you light it on fire and you throw it like this, it will just hit on your arm or the bed. So we talk about turtles. Turtles are not good. So goodbye and good night and happy finishing. <laughs> so cute. Oh. She's adorable. I said that to my mom and I was like, I'm not crying, you're crying. Um, so a shout out to all the dads and the moms out there that are encouraging this type of curiosity in their kids. It's amazing. Um, but I digress. So, so the idea of possibly becoming a role model, uh, that is probably what most deeply drives my passion for science communication. Because I had an amazing role model in high school. Kathy Jones was my physics teacher, and she was so enthusiastic for science. She was the kind of teacher that got you incredibly excited for not just the cool demonstrations and experiments, but also you get to learn the math and figure out how the world works. And you get to learn the deeper, a deeper understanding of the laws of the universe, which for a lot of people is like, that doesn't get me excited. But if you have the right teacher, that makes you so pumped to learn about the world. And that's what Kathy Jones did for me. And I know that not a, lot of, not a lot of people throughout the world have teachers like you and like Kathy Jones who inspire that kind of curiosity. So uh, this is what the internet allows us YouTubers to do, is to be kind of the diverse role models that kids might not have in the classroom and they might need. Uh, and it's amazing. I feel really honored to you know, be able to, to reach someone like Santasha. Um, I'd like to take a step back, though, for a moment, because it is one thing to uh, do this as a hobby, something like making YouTube videos. And it's another thing to take that and make a career out of it, to make a living out of it. Um, and so far, so far, I've managed to do that. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit today about how I made that happen and what was it that helped me make this career out of a path that wasn't clear. Um, so one thing that I kept doing through this journey from science student to science communicator was to put myself in a place to get lucky. And, and I have to admit that a lot of the success of what I have and what I've been able to do has been luck. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, people don't like to hear that. Fortunately, um, it's not just luck. It is putting yourself in the position to get lucky. So when I, when I graduated from college, I had made a couple of these YouTube videos, uh, and I sent them to a teacher that I had had at MIT who I knew was interested in outreach. And I guess he kept up with the videos because he got a new job at UC San Diego. And uh, his name is Adam Bergasser, by the way. Um, I feel like I should mention him in case he ever watches this someday. Uh, but so he offered me a job at UC San Diego doing outreach because he knew that I was interested in science communication because I had sent him these little videos that I had made. And I ended up working there for a year, running science camps, making more videos, and sort of boosting my experience in science communication. And I did this kind of thing, you know, telling people, and sometimes telling the right people, what I was interested in and what I wanted to do with my life so that they could then help me along to the next step in my career. 
Um, I did that with Derek Muller, who some of you may know is, is the host of Veritasium. Uh, his channel was pretty popular at the time that I was starting, so I sent him many emails, and I basically stalked him all the way to a party in Los Angeles where I met him finally, and he eventually gave me an internship and sort of mentored me on the way up throughout this career. So these were all examples of um, you know, putting myself in a position to get lucky. It's like buy, buying a ton of lottery tickets. You know, it's hard to win the lottery, but the more tickets you buy, the more likely you are to win. Uh, another thing that I did um, throughout this career was that I combined my random skills to find a niche within, within the, the world of YouTube. So there's an audience for everything on YouTube, as I'm sure you know. Did you know that there's a hydraulic press channel where they just smash things with a hydraulic press? It's incredibly popular. Also one for popping pimples, which is also incredibly popular, also very gross. Um, so that, that was not my niche. I found a different niche than that, but I found a niche. I found something slightly different on YouTube. Um, and then I was asked to talk a little bit today about what I learned in college versus what I learned afterwards in my career. Um, and I think it's a bit hard for me to separate those two things now. But what I learned in college, I think, was how to think scientifically, how to think rationally. But also I built a network of people um, that I, I met in college that were also eager and are now doing wonderful things. And I can sort of pull on their expertise later on. Um, but one thing that I, that I did learn was how to teach myself new things, how to learn new things. Um, so that's the, the third thing here. Be open to learning. Um, I learned the skills to say, if I need to learn how a camera works, if I need to learn how, audio, how, how to edit, if I need to learn um, how to do audio, I have the confidence that I can learn that stuff. I can do it. I don't need to turn to somebody else to do my video editing. I do have an editor, but I don't need to, just so you know, Jabril, if you're watching. Um, I, I have the confidence that I can teach myself how to do these new skills, and I think that's something really important that I learned in college. Uh, so, by the way, for all of you students out there, um, I went to college first and got a degree first before deciding that I wanted to make a YouTube career. Um, <laughs> Because it, you never know what's going to happen with media, with social media, with jobs. Uh, it's, it's, the world is constantly changing, so YouTube may not be there. Who knows how long I will be this lucky to have this job. Um, but it's great to have skills to fall back on, like working as a software engineer or working as a scientist. And I would absolutely love to go back to those jobs. So to find multiple passions is also something that's good in case life throws you some new curveballs. Uh, and the last thing that I, I didn't write up here, but um, just start making things. Like if you think that you want to be involved in something, just start doing it. Uh, here's a little piece of advice. If you reach out to a YouTuber and you're like, I want to be a YouTuber. Can you, po you know, can you share my channel? Can you promote me? If you have more than one video on your channel, we're going to be much more receptive to that because it shows that initiative that you already want to, you're right there, you want to learn, um, and you're already putting in the work to learn how to do it yourself. So uh, go for it. The best way to learn something new is to start projects that, that involve those skills. So just start making those videos. That's how I learned to do all this. I made the videos. Um, so. That is the next step, making the videos. What goes on? What is the nitty gritty of making videos? How do you make a really popular video? How do you make a viral video? That's what everyone wants to know. Um, I have no idea. I do not know the magic formula for making viral videos. I'm definitely not an expert in that, but I am an expert in asking a lot of questions, so many questions. My parents told me that uh, I came out day one asking questions. In fact, I have a picture of myself from that day. This is me. Um, but honestly, I really am. I, this is Hermione. I don't know if some of you might not recognize. OK, yeah, OK. <laughs> 
I'm more of a Ron, but you know, Hermione's great too. Uh, but really, I really am a curious person. And, and I think that that's the first clue to making a science video that's really popular, and that is curiosity. Um, okay, I want you to do another exercise with me. Imagine that you are getting ready for bed. I know that we're all in different time zones. Uh, I'm very tired, it's about 5 a.m. in California. So you're just cuddling up, you're getting ready to go to sleep, you're very tired, you're lying down and you've finished your last tweet about your passions for the day, so you put your phone aside, getting ready to go pass out, when all of a sudden, a question pops into your head. How do your eyes see white on a phone screen when there are only red, green, and blue pixels? Like, you know when you, you are holding your phone and you sneeze on it and your snot amplifies the pixels and you see red, green, and blue? How does that work and turn it into white? It's a great question. But you know that you have more of the conference the next day and you gotta get some good beauty sleep, uh, get, hand out some, you know, do some networking, hand out some business cards. So you stretch, you, you put your thoughts aside, you're getting nice and relaxed when another question pops into your head. Is it possible to make a cannon out of air? It's also a great question. In fact, at this point, you cannot sleep. You need to know, is it possible to make a cannon out of air? So you get out of bed and you ask for a volunteer from the audience to help you with your experiment. Anyone? Oh. You are all teachers. You know that you have to call on volunteers sometimes and you're all hesitant to, there we go. Yeah, come on up. Now you know what it feels like to be the students in your classroom where you're like, I need a volunteer, and they're sitting there wide-eyed. <laughs> Amazing. All right. Can you think of a way to make an air cannon? Yeah? Yeah? yeah. Oh, I'd like to hear it. Um, I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> she saw my box <laughs> over here. Yeah, we might have done. Yeah, we might have done the thing for you. This is also a pretty common, common uh, demo. OK, so you've seen this before? Uh, not this, but yeah. I, Something I like this? this? Yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. Has anyone seen this kind of contraption before? Okay, yeah, physics teachers are raising their hands. <laughs> no, this is perfect, come on up. Okay. What is your name? Asma. Asma, nice to meet you. Where are you from? Uh, All over, Jordan, okay. <laughs> I work here, so. Got it, got it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna try to hit you with this air cannon. Good. Yeah, so we, did, we already did the thinking for you all because I know you're very tired. You want to sleep like this cat. Um, so this is just a stretchy diaphragm on this side. There's air obviously inside the box. And on this side, we have a hole. And so we're going to try to use this. Because, you know, if I just went, I can't hit someone over on the side of the room. But I'm going to try to hit you with this air cannon. Yeah, from this side. Tell me if you feel it. Are you ready? <laughs> Hopefully I won't knock you over. Okay, you ready? Three, two, one. Nothing? Didn't feel it? Okay, one more time. You felt it that time? Yeah, we can't see your, your hair move as much, so yeah, maybe you can try to hit me. Okay. <laughs> it's hard to aim. Go for it. You gotta, you gotta sort of tap it, it's not that elastic. Yeah. One more time. Oh, did you see that? It was like a, oh, it was like a little breeze. Oh. No, honestly. You honestly feel it. You'll have to come up afterwards and feel the air cannon. Thank you so much. No yes, it is possible to make a cannon out of air. Um, this is going to get a little more exciting, I promise. Um, not that much more exciting, though. Uh, <laughs> so let's see if I can maybe hit you guys in the front here. Anything? Nope. Yeah? You feel the puffs? Yes. We got a yes. A different, definite yes over here. So this, uh, this demo is unfortunately uh, uh, truncated because we had brought a smoke machine all the way from the US to use in here. Uh, but we were told that, that fog machines might set off the alarms in these buildings, which would be unfortunate for the 3,000 people that are here. So we don't get to see what the puff of air looks like. 
But the question, the next question I would ask is, what do you think that that puff of air that can go all the way across the stage and hit somebody, what do you think it looks like? And then to answer the question, we would put a little bit of fog inside of the box and do it again. It's very cool, but I'm going to have to show you a video of it because they wouldn't let us use the fog machine here. So if you, if you have like little reviews that you do after the conference, complain about not being able to use the fog machine, okay? All right, so this is a little, this is the first day that we got the fog machine and we made this and we tested it all out. This is what the puff of air looks like. Did you see it? Am I standing in the way? Yeah, you all saw it? Yeah, so it's like a little ring. Yeah, so what that actually is, is that is a ring vortex. That is the same kind of thing as like a bubble ring. A vortex is um, a spinning line of, of fluid or liquid or air, um, like a hurricane or a tornado. But what this is, is it's a full ring. That, that line that's spinning is, is turned into a ring. So when you push air out of this circle, you are actually making kind of the same thing as a tornado or a hurricane, and it travels really nicely in this kind of coherent, what we call a vortex, and hits you in the face. Um, and it traps smoke in it if there's smoke in there, and it carries the smoke with it. Um, and this is actually the same phenomenon that my, I made my most popular video about. Um, it was a vortex ring in the pool, so what we did was we made half of this vortex ring with a plate, and so I'm going to show you a little clip from that video. Check this out. I'm just going to drag this plate through the water in the pool. That's it. But look what forms. Perfect black circles on the bottom of the pool. And it's so weird. They don't die. They just keep going right next to each other. I sped this footage up because the circles took three minutes to cross the pool and didn't seem to be dying out. These got sharper as they went and made it all the way across. So cool. And look closer. You can see what's causing them. There are two... Sorry, cut to a different video. This is where we actually spent more time putting food coloring in the sides of the vortex. I couldn't see what I was filming, but this just looked... I don't remember what I said there. <laughs> it looked amazing, something like that. Um, yeah, so this, was, this ended up being my most popular video because, uh, because it was something unusual. And that's the takeaway here, is that when, you're, when you find something unusual, you ask the unusual questions, like, can you make an air cannon? Or uh, what happens when you move a plate through the pool? You know, when you ask these kind of unusual questions, when you get really curious, that is part of the key to making the, the popular videos. And that's sort of the theme of a lot of the most popular videos that I've made. Um, they're, they're sort of a variety of different things, but, but these are the top eight videos that I've made. Um, these four, I would say, sort of fall into the category of unusual phenomena. Uh, we've got the crazy pool vortex, how to make a cloud in your mouth, uh, this can explodes by putting electricity around an electromagnet, and then we've got the stacked ball drop, which is a pretty standard physics demo, but we added another ball to see if we could stack it and drop it. Um, and then these three are all brain teasers, which are sort of unusual questions to challenge your mind. And then this one, are perpetual motion machines possible? I have no idea why this video was popular. Um, in fact, the answer was no, perpetual motion machines are not possible because of the laws of physics, and yet most of the comments were, okay, but what about my idea for a perpetual motion machine? So I, this is, I guess it, it sparks, you know, curiosity in some way. But yeah, so, so we've got unusual phenomena, brain teasers, and perpetual motion. I don't get it. But what these all have in common is that they are unusual. They're asking some kind of question and getting you curious. Uh, so, yeah, so now you've picked the topic. You've picked the topic for your video. Uh, the next thing to do is to communicate your topic well. Um, so these are some of the factors that I've learned have made or um, have, might make or break a, a video, a good a science video on YouTube. Um, what makes an effective science video? So is your video enthusiastic? 
you know, if I had made this pool vortex video and I had maybe not shown the video at all, like I just talked about the pool vortex but not shown the footage, not that effective. If I had been, you know, really unenthusiastic about it, just sort of showing it as a demonstration. Uh, I actually have a, a demo here of enthusiastic versus not to show what I mean by making enthusiastic videos. So this is not excited. We are going to find out what color is by examining the unusual properties of light, a wave that can travel through space and allows us to see objects in our everyday life. So that is, that is not excited. That's an example of not excited. And then this is the same text, but with excitement. We're going to find out what color is by examining the unusual properties of light, a wave that can travel through space and allows us to see objects in our everyday life. Yeah, so it's got a little bit more oomph there. And excitement is incredibly contagious. That's been shown time and time again. It's shown, you know, in every single classroom. Excitement is contagious, and it's shown on YouTube. Um, now, if, you've, if your gimmick is like being really sarcastic or is sort of a personality that's really dry, that can work. But for the most part, you still have to show you're enthusiastic about your material. Um, is your video concise? If you could say in 10 minutes what you said in an hour, you probably don't belong on YouTube. Maybe live streaming, but not YouTube. Uh, is it accessible? Is, it, is the topic right for the audience that you're trying to reach? That's something that I always ask. Um, am I aiming at the right audience? And did you cut out the jargon that, um, that you might you know, want to use because you're familiar with the topic? So I've got another example of that here. This is uh, too much jargon. Most refractory coatings to date exhibit a lack of reliability when subject to the impingement of entrained particulate matter in the propellant stream under extended firing durations. Yeah. And then this is the same topic, but with less jargon. The exhaust gas eventually damages the coating of most existing ceramics. Yeah, so still kind of a technical topic, but it's more common words that you can parse through. Cut out that jargon. So these are the biggest factors uh, uh, that I've found in the last five years of doing this make more of an effective science video and a video that can be more popular on YouTube. Make it exciting and enthusiastic. Make sure that your excitement is coming across. Make it concise. Cut it down if you can. Make it accessible. Make sure that you're reaching the, the, the right audience. And use less jargon. And then lead with examples. I've sort of uh, you know, showed you examples of some of these things. So if you can lead with examples in your video, that also makes your video much more effective. Um, yeah, so we're coming up to the conclusion of how to take your passion and turn it into your career. Um, I want to share one more story. Um, and this story is actually about my editor. Um, his name is Jabril. Let me show you a picture of him so you know what kind of character we're dealing with. Uh, so Jabril reached out to me about two years ago, and he had had a prank channel, which is popular on YouTube. Um, it, was, it, was relatively, it, it, was, it was relatively successful. He was doing really well with his prank channel, but he decided to completely change gears and start a science channel. So he started this channel, SCFD Science, and uh, he, made, he made some good strides. I think he grew his channel to about 8,000, 10,000 subscribers over the course of a few years. Um, I loved his content, but after two years, three years of doing this, he decided that his real passion was actually machine learning and artificial intelligence. And uh, he had seen people make, make games with artificial intelligence and machine learning when he was younger, and he wanted to do that. But he had, uh, he had dropped out of college. He hadn't um, taken you know, the right amount of algebra. He didn't have the calculus background needed to write machine learning. He had taught himself coding, but not enough programming. So he decided he was just going to go for it, teach himself calculus, teach himself the right algebra, teach himself uh, the, the rest of the coding that he needed, and he did it. And I watched him, you know, since six months ago when we first talked about this change in his channel to now, uh, 
making his first machine learning games. And it was incredible to see his enthusiasm for these new projects. Um, and to see then him taking those topics that he made and the projects that he made and create a channel about that. And in the same time, his channel blew up. His, his channel went from you know, the, the 8,000 to now 65,000 plus subscribers in a few months. And I think it's because this is what he was truly passionate about. He found something really interesting to him and he did something different from sort of the other science channels on YouTube that at this point are, are doing very similar things. He found his niche. And so in this story, we've got sort of all the different factors that I talked about you know, in, in, um, in a successful career, which are you know, finding what you're truly passionate about, finding what's gonna drive you. For him, it was leveling up. It was learning new things, becoming you know, uh, an AI expert in his own way by teaching himself. It was um, wanting, to, uh, wanting to create new things, finish the projects. He sort of had all of the different aspects that can drive your passion. And at the same time, has made an incredibly successful channel. And I think it really shows people were starting to notice. Um, and obviously his channel is becoming much more successful. So I, uh, with that, you know, with that story sort of wrapping up all the different things that I talked about, um, taking your passion and turning it into a career, I am incredibly excited for the next wave of educators on YouTube who are gonna come in after me uh, because they are the next wave of learners. They're the next wave of people who are, are, are teaching themselves and then putting themselves out there for us to watch them learn, which I think is really exciting. Um, and, and they're the next wave of people, the next round of people who are gonna turn their passions into a career. I'm very excited to see that. So that's all I've got for you. Thank you so much. You. Goodbye, live stream. Um, I think that there's I'm going to just say end the live stream, but I think that there's some time for questions if you've got any questions about this. Yeah, right there. You had your hand up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Yeah. Mm hmm. How do you inspire girls to become physicists? Ugh, this is the, the frustrating question I think about every day. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the, the magic answer is. I think that it's gonna have to come from a cultural shift and change as to what girls can do, what we all think girls can do and girls are capable of. Um, but definitely encouraging those girls where you see some promise, or all of them, you know, encouraging them to take math classes, take science classes. I had a teacher who told me, and I remember this line so, so clearly in my head when he told me, girls who do physics are cool. I remember being like, I was, a, I was like an awkward middle schooler, I was like, I wanna be cool. And he told me that, girls who do physics are cool. So it's, it's definitely that encouragement from teachers, from people that they look up to, that they can do it, that they should try, uh, and that they can still be cool. Yeah, you had a question. Um, how long have you been doing professional advice personally? Mm. Lessons yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you said, lesson targets. Yep. So, yeah. Um, a good length for YouTube videos, I would say, it really depends on what you're making, um, but three to ten minutes, I think, is a good, good um, time to aim for. There's a channel called Minute Physics, and he used to make videos that were a minute or less. And it's kind of a fun challenge to take, uh, maybe not that complicated of a topic, but, but a science topic, and try to explain it in, I'm going to take this off. Thank you. <laughs> um, to explain it in a minute or less. So maybe to do an Instagram video um, series on science because those have to be, I think, 60 seconds or less. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, great. Uh, great. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank Quick you. Quick question for you. I, I could really benefit from your advice here. So I run a foundation, and we focus on early childhood development. Awesome. There's a lot of great research coming out there from Harvard in other places. 
and this is not really a word, but I want to decomplexify the research mm. and make it palatable to a general audience, particularly I'm thinking about parents who have very young kids and getting them parents who would not normally read an academic paper, mm -hmm. but who really benefit from some of these messages about toxic stress or reading to your kid or all of these sort of things. Mm. Okay, so how do we do that? Now, we're, we're backing some research and we have some people who are gr doing great research, do I, uh, uh, postdoctorals, doctorals and so forth. Do I go to them and say, look, it'd be great if you guys did some videos mm. individually and go for it, or, or is it better for us as a foundation to think about identifying some really charismatic person and grabbing their research and then decomposing? Is there a panacea or what do you recommend? Yeah, I think that there's a way to combine all of that. Um, one thing that I've been doing a lot more lately because I have the resources is interviewing scientists. So I can talk about all this stuff if I want. I can ask them questions and say it in my own words. Or I can you know, show off scientists who are really actually doing the research. Um, so the day, that, the day that I flew here, I was in LA interviewing a biomechanicist about what stretching does to your body and talking to him about things that I have no expertise in um, and that he is passionate about and his passion comes through because that's his research. Um, and you get the same ratings, if you will? Like you get the same, people are really equally engaged in those videos as the ones that are just with you? Um, Not sure yet. I, you know, I, I yes. It, de it really depends on... The, the engagement has so much more to do with the topic than it does necessarily with the presentation. I'm still in them. I, I'm still, you know, I present what I think is interesting and then I sort of make a narrative around what they're talking about. Um, so I'll, what I'll do is I'll take his interview, I'll cut it down, and then I'll write a narrative and be like, these are the questions that I had for him. I didn't know the answer to this, so I went and asked an expert. And then, you know, cut through his interview and be like, when he talked about this, it was incredibly interesting. He had me do a stretching test to see how flexible I was. Turns out I'm not that flexible, you know, but, but like sort of cut in my relation to my curiosity and my learning with his research. And I've done that with a number of different scientists, especially women. This happened to be a guy, but <laughs> it's good to show off women in physics as well. Any more questions? Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Say I want to start uh, doing videos, mm -hmm. maybe doing some modeling within my classroom, or I, I'm really into teacher leadership, showing some things that I do for teachers. Mm. So could you give me some advice on how to start that and then to get followers? Mm, mm. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, so, so you're talking about you making videos versus having your students make videos, is that correct? Well, I would, okay, so say I want to model a strategy. Yeah. And so I could talk to the teachers about the strategy, but then show that within my classroom walls. Mm, I see. And so that's what I'm th really thinking about literacy yeah. and trying to do something with that because we do have parents that do not know what to do with uh, students. And then we also have teachers who lack of understanding of foundational skills. Mm -hmm. And so I've just been brainstorming that concept. Mm -hmm. So what could I do on YouTube mm -hmm. to make that available to teachers or parents mm -hmm. uh, thinking about those stakeholders? Yeah. So could you give me some advice? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, some, some of the... Some of the points that I hit on in here um, will help you get followers. That is always really hard. Uh, there are things like you know sharing across your social media platforms, um, telling everyone that you know you're doing this video series. Make a few videos first. Get some feedback on which ones you know they think are good and which formats you should go with. Um, so you can try out a few things to, to make the videos like a, a good quality first, and that'll help get the followers and bring them in. Um, but also find, you know, find a unique way of, of talking about the topics you're talking about. You, know, you can find any number of videos talking about science or teaching this and that, but it's the ones that are unique that end up getting the views and getting the, the hits. Um, there's a, a YouTube channel called Acapella Science that tries to teach biology by uh, singing, and it's incredibly popular, um, but he, you know, 
the, the message there is not quite as effective, but, you know, because it's hidden in song, but he ha is having the hits and things like that. So it depends on what the goal is of the videos. It depends on who exactly you want to, to uh, watch the videos. But, but again, just start making them. You know, try a few different formats. See what the people you want to watch the videos, see what they think. Get a bit of feedback on different formats that you try and... Um, I, I always think that it's really beneficial to get your kids involved with the videos as well. Um, make, having them make videos uh, teaches them how to teach, which means that they're going to learn the material much more thoroughly. So I don't know, maybe parents are going to watch more if you have kids making the videos um, and they're sassy up there and they're like, listen here to this information I need you to know. <laughs> yeah, there's some, there's some fun ways to get kids involved too and that it's always, you know, everyone had their eyes on Santasha when she was talking. She's so adorable and so cute. So use the, that resource you have, which is kids. Um, yeah, yeah. Ooh, that's a great question. What um, type of branding is needed yeah. uh, so people can catch on? Yeah, uh, I think about, a th uh, yeah, think about a name that you think um, matches the goal that you have. I, I'm so terrible at branding. Um, <laughs> I honestly don't know how to answer that question that well. Um, I, I would say, honestly, the content comes first and make sure that you've got a series. And then once you've got it, start asking around again. Like, tell people what series you want to make. Think of some titles. Run that by your friends. See if it matches what they think that your series is doing. Get a lot of feedback, I would say. Um, was there one more question? Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. Um, I really like the presentation, and I love the passion behind it. Thank you. Um, I want to throw you to the other end of the sea. OK. I am from Africa. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the issue of contextualization. Yep, yep. Um, the videos and, and the information that we have might be fantastic to a particular audience, mm -hmm. and the other type of audience might not understand. Yep. Yet it is the same concept that we want to yep. utilize. Mm -hmm. So two things. One, um, are we allowed to customize what you have mm. so that it can be of benefit to the students? Or two, will we have an opportunity to interact with you and provide maybe some information that you can help develop some of from the perspectives in which we are in mm. so that they can understand it from that angle. Thank you. Those are excellent questions. Um, I've thought about this a lot, and I've gotten this feedback actually from viewers, which is like, you talk about a roller coaster in one of my videos, um, but a lot of kids throughout the entire world have never been on a roller coaster or don't know what it feels like or what, you know, um, I talk about, it's like the feeling of being on a roller coaster, but if they've never been on one, that's, that's not something they can relate to. Um, so, I don't want this to sound like a cop-out, but, but, you know, I made these videos as a passion project, um, and one of my goals is to reach girls. One of my goals is to reach people around the world um, with these videos, it's more of a learning experience for me and me becoming a better science communicator to then next go and make those next projects. A new science show that's going to reach girls more than these videos do. Because some of them I talk about, you know, generators and things that are above their level. Um, the the ne a next series might be something that's more global or, or is aimed at different, uh, you know, geographical areas around the world. So while I don't think that these videos, the, you know, this, this limited physics girl series is necessarily going to be what, uh, what might reach a broader audience or reach the younger audience or the female audience that I want to reach, I, I personally am gaining the skills to become a better science communicator and then be able to, to get feedback from someone who knows about early childhood education and can help me work those the studies that we've done into a new series um, and, and sort of get deeper into being really, really effective at reaching these people that we're not currently reaching. Um, the series that I have was about me expressing my passion, me having a lot of fun talking about physics, um, and also reaching people that, 
you know, it, within my community in the, in the US and Canada, you know, who might have more of my cultural references and understand them. Um, but, uh, but that's not, you know, that's not where it stops. That's my, maybe where this series stops, but yeah, absolutely. That's something that I've thought about and I would love to pursue in future projects. I think that that's about it. Yeah, that's about it. Thank you so much for listening.